Okay, welcome. We should get started. Um, nice to see a full house here for this very special event. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Stephen Kinzer. Uh, I'm Peter Andreas, the Associate uh, Director here at the Watson Institute. This is part of the uh, Security Seminar Series. Um, Stephen Kinzer did not have to travel far. He is based here at the Institute. In fact, uh, this is one of his many talks on his book tour, but arguably the cheapest stop <laughs> on his book tour. He didn't have to travel far, and we're not paying him a lot uh, to come. Uh, the book is one of his many books. It's just the latest. Um, the Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War. I just checked before coming down in, on Amazon. It is the number one selling book under the category Intelligence and Espionage. So very timely in that regard. It's also number 272 overall, which I can tell you as an academic, um, that's an enviable number. Only journalists and public figures uh, such as Stephen Kinzer get into the hundreds rather than the thousands in terms of the Amazon rankings. Um, anyway, let me give you a little bit more background on Stephen. Um, actually dating myself a bit, um, uh, his, probably his best known book is called Bitter Fruit. I don't even know what the subtitle, but it's about the U.S. support uh, for the military coup in Guatemala uh, in 1953. And I read it as an undergraduate, not in 1953. Um, and uh, I knew his name ever since then. And um, he is an award-winning journalist who worked for more than 20 years uh, for the New York Times, most of it as a foreign correspondent. Uh, and uh, he was the Times Bureau Chief in Nicaragua during the 80s, in Germany during the 1990s. In 1996, he was named Chief of the newly opened Times Bureau in Istanbul, and later was appointed National Culture Correspondent based in uh, Chicago. Uh, today, uh, he uh, is no longer at the Times. He uh, teaches, including here at Brown University in the International Relations Program. But he's taught journalism, political science, international relations at Northwestern, and BU, as well as here at Brown. And his many books have been including Central America. I mentioned Bitter Fruit, but also a book on Rwanda, a book on Turkey, Iran, um, as well as others that trace the history of American foreign policy. He's a contributor to the New York Review of Books, and he writes a world affairs column uh, for The Guardian. So without further ado, let me welcome Stephen Kinzer. But last but not least, I want to tell you there are, in fact, books outside and a small reception that we'll have immediately after uh, the talk. So welcome. Thanks for that gracious introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm seeing some old friends and some new friends and at least one brown freshman who I've known since she was a small baby, uh, which I guess the only kind there is. Uh, and it's especially uh, rewarding for me to be here uh, giving this talk at, at Watson. This is a wonderful institution, but I think for those of us affiliated with it, it's particularly interesting to be here at this moment. This is not just an interesting institution, but a very interesting moment, I think, in the history of this institution. So it's great to be a part of that. Um, I've been traveling around, as Peter mentioned, talking about this book. And uh, I've already had at least one very rewarding experience, although it's kind of nice to be up on the Amazon list. And my book will be reviewed in the New York Times uh, next Sunday. I've already seen that review, so that's, that's nice. Um, but uh, I did have a, a problem in all my previous books that always bothered me. And that is, in, in many bookstores, in the days when there used to be bookstores, um, my books were in something like the public affairs or current events section. And they'd be filed alphabetically. So I would always wind up being next to Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and I didn't like that. Uh, but I didn't know any way to escape it. But now, with the fading away of bookstores and everybody buying their books on Amazon, I have a different neighbor. If you type into Amazon, The Brothers, the first book that comes up is mine. And right next to it, right next to me, is The Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> so I've gone from Kissinger to Dostoevsky as a companion, which is a big, big step up, as far as I'm concerned. Um, when I started researching uh, the Dulles Brothers, uh, I'd already I already knew a little bit about them because they had been characters who wandered across the pages of some of my previous books. I always felt that they d deserved something more than just the bit character roles that I was able to assign to them. In fact, 
that's part of my, my mission, I guess. Uh, I, I like to rearrange the perspectives of history. I sometimes look at footnotes in history books and think that that footnote is actually more important than the entire chapter. Uh, one thing I've really come to understand as I've read a lot and traveled a lot and worked in many countries is that the way we understand history is not necessarily the way it was. Some events are very important and others are less important, but which events go into which category is quite subjective. Uh, many of the episodes that I've written about, it's a dark moment for us here. So I, I won't say anything bad about the CIA anymore, I promise. <laughs> many of the episodes uh, that I've written about really uh, are, or I like to think were, forgotten. Uh, if you read a history of the 20th century that's a thousand pages long, you'd be lucky to find, for example, one sentence about the U.S. overthrow of the government of Iran in 1953, despite the huge uh, effects that that had. I think there's a reason for that, and that is that all governments in all countries, just like all individuals, like to think of ourselves in a positive way. We like to accept narratives that show us the way we believe that we are. This might be one of the many reasons why there's such an unending uh, interest in World War II, and there's always new videos and new movies and new books. They could fill up this entire building uh, with just one year's worth. Of course, World War II was a hugely important episode, but I think there's another reason why we're so fascinated with it. Uh, it shows us the way we like to think that we are. We fought evil dictators, and when we left, there was democracy and freedom. Other episodes in our history don't show us that way, so we like to forget them or overlook them or see them as minor footnotes. The Dulles brothers are really an example of this. Uh, it's remarkable to me that uh, these brothers, who were so hugely powerful in their time, they were able to make and break governments, and they did, uh, are now so forgotten. Probably when they were in power, there was hardly a literate human being on earth that did not know the name Dulles. But now, when I was writing this book, uh, periodically friends of mine would ask, so what are, you, what are you working on now? What are you writing about? And I'd say, well, I'm writing about Dulles. And they'd say, the airport? <laughs> Actually, uh, as you know, Dulles Airport uh, outside Washington is named after John Foster Dulles. Uh, this was Eisenhower's idea. Immediately after Foster Dulles died, he, he announced that this new super airport was going to be named after his uh, beloved Secretary of State. By the time the airport was ready to be opened, however, John F. Kennedy was president. He didn't like the idea of naming it after Dulles uh, and announced through his FAA chairman that they would find another name. Uh, there was a lot of pushback, including from Alan Dulles and from ex-President Eisenhower. Kennedy finally relented. And I've seen the little video clip of President Kennedy opening Dulles Airport. So there's Eisenhower, and uh, Foster Dulles' widow is there, Alan Dulles is there, Kennedy gives a nice little speech, and then he pulls back the uh, curtain to reveal this big bust of John Foster Dulles that stands in the center of uh, Dulles Airport in front of the big reflecting pool. So as I was starting out on this project, I decided that uh, I needed to go and stand in front of that bust which, uh, for some reason, I had missed, even though I'd gone through the airport a number of times. So I made a trip and passed through the Dulles Airport, and when I got off the plane, I asked one of the security guards, so where's the bust? And he looked at me blankly, and I said, well, the, the bust of John Foster Dulles, still blank. Uh, I asked, well, who, who do you think this airport was named for? Doesn't know. Well, I said, but there's, there's a bust in the middle of the airport, right? Never heard of it. I left him, and I went on to another, more knowledgeable security guard, but I got the same answer. And finally, I realized I should ask for the reflecting pool, because I had read that it's in front of the reflecting pool. No, there's no reflecting pool in this airport either. I had to get on another flight, and I was quite puzzled by all of this. That's a long story, but finally, the ending was that it, with the help of the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, I discovered that in the late 1990s, there was a renovation at Dulles Airport, and when the renovation was finished, the reflecting pool had been filled in, and the Dulles bust was gone. Nobody has ever been able to tell me who ordered that or why that happened. However, I did manage to get the lady from the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority to open up a closed conference room opposite 
baggage claim number three, and there is the bust of John Foster Dulles. This is a wonderful metaphor to me about how we have airbrushed Dulles and uh, his legacy out of our history. Maybe the reason is that his approach to the world really didn't pay off very well for us. It, it didn't work out. Rather than confront that fact and try to draw some lessons from the Dulles brothers and their experience during the 1950s, it's easier to forget them and pretend they never existed. Uh, and I think we've moved on from them in ways that are uh, dangerous and unpleasant and uh, threatening for us. I want to bring them back to life and br give them the importance in history that I think they deserve. Uh, they reflect forces that still shape the United States. The forces that shaped them shaped us, shaped our nation, shaped many of us as individuals. They did then, and, and they still do. So as many of you know, during the 1950s, we had this situation that occurred only once in history, and that was that brothers control the overt and covert sides of American foreign policy. Uh, it was a dangerous arrangement because these brothers had been raised quite intimately together, and they came to view the world in exactly the same way. The experiences that shaped them were the same. And once they were in these high positions of power, because they were so close and so identical in their worldviews, uh, they never felt the need to consult anyone else when carrying out these hugely important and uh, earth-shattering operations. They converted the foreign policy process into a kind of reverberating echo chamber for the certainties that they had grown up sharing. Uh, they came from a privileged background and I think never confronted the reality that for most people in life, sometimes things go badly wrong. You can't control everything. You have terrible reverses. But those things never happened to the Dulles brothers, and they never happened to anybody that the Dulles brothers knew. They had a very small enclosed circle. That's the circle that shaped American foreign policy for at least the first half of the 20th century, all the same kinds of people. And uh, I think they were also victims of something that we still suffer from, and that is this supra-rational view that since we're the United States, everything is going to work out for us in the end. We are going to be able to control the course of history. In a sense, we're above history. History doesn't apply to us. Uh, this is, some, this is a, a view that the Dulles brothers had, although I think they had it subconsciously. It was an assumption they worked on. And I think it still cripples us a little bit. Uh, you know, the can-do mentality is a wonderful thing. The can-do mentality tells you that if you want something badly enough and you work hard enough, you're going to get it. And this is what allowed Americans to build our country and to cross the prairies and invent the light bulb and the airplane. It led us to triumph over obstacles that are posed by technology and by the environment and by other people. But there's a negative side to the can-do mentality because there are some things in life and some things in this world that if you really want to accomplish and you work really hard to accomplish, you still can't accomplish. And that includes overcoming obstacles that are rooted in deep-seated cultures, including cultures that have existed far longer than the United States. So let me talk a little bit about the Dulles brothers and the forces that shaped them and then take us through into uh, their, their period in office. Uh, I can think of three forces that were particularly important, I think, in shaping the, the Dulles brothers' mentality and uh, the way they saw themselves their country and the world. The first was that the Dulles brothers truly were vessels of American history. They were in a transition period. Uh, and they were maybe the most effective bridges between the 19th and the 20th centuries. The, uh, when they were kids, they grew up on the shores of Lake Ontario. And uh, they had two famous relatives who were their two favorite relatives. Their grandfather, John Watson Foster, had been Secretary of State. And their uncle was also Secretary of State. Uh, every morning during the summers, the two little boys would get up. They lived in a parsonage, so they had to say their prayers. They sang some hymns. They took a cold shower, which was the only kind their father, Reverend Dulles, allowed. And then they ran down to the lakeshore 
where a grandfather Foster, this extravagantly bewhiskered patriarch of the Republican Party, and Uncle Bert, known to the rest of us as Secretary of State Lansing, uh, were waiting for them. And the four of them, these two boys and their two older relatives who doted on them, would spend every summer day stalking the wily small-mouthed bass in the eddies along the, uh, along the shores of Lake Ontario. And those were not just fishing trips. They were a cascade of lessons in American history. John Watson Foster had lived the classic pioneer life in the age of manifest destiny. He had traveled westward in the middle of the 19th century, fought the savages, tamed the wilderness, ingratiated himself to important people, built himself a business, bought a newspaper, became active in politics, finally managed to help swing votes in a couple of elections, got himself a diplomatic posting, rose to this high position of being uh, Secretary of State, and actually set the family off into the regime change business. Because John Watson Foster was the first Secretary of State in American history to preside over the US overthrow of a foreign government. He was the Secretary of State who was in power and oversaw the overthrow of the government of Hawaii in 1893. So uh, he set a pattern, I guess, for the family. Uh, but think about this, that John Watson Foster, the grandfather, had campaigned for Abraham Lincoln. And the two boys who spent their youth and adolescence under his influence went on to project American power throughout the world in the nuclear age. So the span of American history is short, I think sometimes a little bit misleading, but the Dulles brothers truly were vessels of this history. So I think their, uh, their upbringing in this elite environment very much shaped them. Grandfather Foster, as they called him, uh, so loved these two boys that he wasn't satisfied with having bought a house near them on Lake Ontario and spending the summers there. He started bringing them to his mansion on DuPont Circle in uh, Washington for winter months. And there they would have dinner with Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, Bernard Baruch, Andrew Carnegie, a parade of ambassadors and cabinet ministers. So uh, they grew up understanding not just the ideas of the elite, but the, the style of the elite and the vocabulary of the elite. Interestingly enough, young Alley, as he was then called, uh, had an interesting way to end these evenings. So he'd sit at dinner with these eminent figures. The boys, of course, were not allowed to participate in the discussion, but they listened very avidly. And they would go up to bed. Foster would go to bed like a normal person. But Alan Dulles didn't do that. Even as a young kid of 12 years old, before he went to bed, he would sit at his desk in his bedroom and write out a report of who had attended the dinner, what they had said, and what he himself thought they really meant by what they said. These were not reports for anybody else. He just did this for himself. This was the guy that would go on to head the CIA more than 50 years later. But he already had this, had this bent. So their childhood was, was very important uh, in this sense. And I think it was important in another way. It gave them another very important uh, view of life. Uh, the Dulleses grew up in the environment of missionary Calvinism. Uh, their father was a Presbyterian minister later a professor of apologetics, which is the field of explaining and defending Christian belief. Their grandfather was a clergyman. Their great-grandfather was a clergyman. Their uncles were clergymen. And most of these relatives were not just Presbyterian ministers, but they were also missionaries. So they were filled with this idea that people, people were always coming back from India, from Syria, from China, and giving them these, this sense of how important it was to go out and, and convert the, the unbelievers. This, this religious tradition teaches you, first of all, that the world is made up of good and evil, and they're constantly at war. Many other cultures don't believe this. Many cultures are brought up, or people in many other cultures are brought up to believe that we're all composed of good and evil impulses, individuals as well as governments, and these come out in different proportion according to circumstance. The Dulles brothers did not believe this. Uh, and it's not only a belief that there's good and evil in the world, but the companion belief that the good people, that is the Christians, are not allowed to sit at home and just pray and hope 
that good will prevail in the world. Your obligation is to go out in the world and bring the unconverted, the heathens, the misguided to the path of righteousness. You're helping them. You're saving them from damnation. If you believe this about religion, it's a very short step to applying the same schema to politics. And you begin to believe there are good regimes in the world and there are evil regimes. And that it's the obligation of the good people, that's us, of course, uh, to go out in the world and crush the evil and bring the evil people to the path of good. So I think this was the second force that was very important in shaping their approach to the world. And the final one certainly was the decades that the Dulles brothers spent working for this remarkable Wall Street law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. This was not a normal law firm. In fact, even calling it a law firm is a little bit misleading. If you needed a contract drawn up or you had to be represented in a courtroom, they had people that could do that. But that was not what people came to Sullivan and Cromwell for. Sullivan and Cromwell had a specialty. And their specialty was pressuring small countries to give in to the demands of big American corporations. And that's why every big American multinational corporation hired Sullivan and Cromwell. Foster Dulles was the managing partner, and Alan Dulles was a partner there. Both worked there for decades. And they participated, even as private lawyers, in a whole series of what I think you would now call interventions abroad. Foster Dulles' very first assignment when he came in as what they called a clerk, we would now call it like a junior associate, was to travel to Guyana and convince the government of Guyana that it should abolish its tariffs on imported flour because a flour manufacturer in the US had hired Sullivan and Cromwell. And he managed to do this. In 1917, this was just to pick another one out of the hat, um, Sullivan and Cromwell received news from some of its clients that had great interest in Cuba. Sullivan and Cromwell represented just about every big American business in Cuba. And they, they were uh, uh, sugar plantation owners, railroad owners, mining uh, companies. An election was held in Cuba in 1917 in which the Liberal Party that had pledged a more nationalistic platform and wanted to limit the role of foreigners in Cuba won. The conservatives were in a panic and refused to give up power. The big American corporations were in an equal panic and wanted to be sure that the conservatives stayed in power. But the liberals were rebelling to demand that the election results be respected. So these clients of Sullivan and Cromwell came to the law firm and said, you've got to do something for us. This is why we hired you. So John Foster Dulles got the case. In fact, this is 1917. First thing he does in New York is get on the train to Washington. He goes to see the Secretary of State, who he knew as Uncle Bert, um, and he told Uncle Bert, that the United States should send two warships to Cuba to crush the liberal rebellion. The next morning, two warships were sent to Cuba. 6,000 Marines landed. They crushed the liberal revolt. They began an occupation that lasted several years. And the American corporations were then free to operate as they wished uh, right up until the end of the 1950s. So the Dulles brothers were in this business long before they came into power. But their experience at Sullivan and Cromwell definitely gave them the view that the interests of the United States and the interests of big American corporations were identical. This was a view that they carried with them into office as they carried with them this view of American exceptionalism that they assimilated from their older relatives and the view of the world that came from their Manichaean religious upbringing. Now, I start the second part of my book where I talk about the, uh, the period when the Dulles brothers were in office with uh, a little reference to a famous speech that John Quincy Adams gave uh, in 1821 on Independence Day to the Congress. And he said in that speech, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. But the Dulles brothers did. One of the themes of my book is that we've misunderstood the 1950s. We think of the 1950s as a time of peace, tense peace. But actually, that's not true. As a matter of fact, the United States was engaged in a constant world war during the 1950s. We didn't see it, because most of it was waged out of view. And those times when it emerged into public view 
we were led to believe that we didn't have anything to do with it, that those were just local uprisings. But we now know, as documents have been declassified and memoirs have been written and histories have been opened, that the Dulles brothers never stopped one intervention, one foreign operation, uh, one attempt to sabotage a government without starting another one. The theater of operations in this war changed from year to year. And that's another reason why I think it's been difficult for us to put it together. It moved from Iran to Guatemala to Vietnam to Indonesia to Egypt to the Congo to Cuba. But this was a constant series of operations. And Alan Dulles made this very clear to his CIA station chiefs. He imposed what uh, my academic colleagues will recognize as a kind of publish or perish mentality. Uh, Alan Dulles didn't want any station chief writing him back notes saying, we're observing the situation, things are unfolding, and we'll keep you posted. You had to have operations going all the time. We had to be active. The Dulles brothers were compulsive activists. Um, of course, we have to place ourselves back in the, in the era in which the Dulles brothers lived. Um, it was a period when many Americans lived in a form of, of permanent fear. Uh, we really believed that the communist world and communist influence was spreading like some kind of a cancerous plague and that it was nipping off pieces of the so-called free world and, and it was kind of like a hotel burglar that was going down the halls checking every door to see which one was open that he could push in. Uh, and there were plenty of reasons for us to see the world this way. Uh, we had had the uh, Soviets testing their nuclear bomb, the communists won the civil war in China, you had the Berlin, uh, the Berlin, Air, Berlin crisis and followed by the Berlin airlift, the fall of uh, countries in Eastern Europe under Soviet rule, in some cases quite brutally. Uh, so it was quite possible to develop this narrative. On the other hand, it's also possible to develop the counter narrative. You can see that uh, the United States had a number of victories during this period as well. We stood up to the Soviets in Greece, in Turkey, in Iran, in Europe. Uh, and it may well, we, we now know that uh, the Soviets were much weaker militarily and economically than, than we thought, and it may well be that the Soviets were more afraid of us than we were of them. We didn't know that at the time, however. Uh, many CIA officers who have looked back at this period have s traced the reason for this to the fact that we had no active espionage in the Soviet Union. We never developed a spy network there during the Second World War because the Soviets were our allies, and then it was too late was impenetrable. So this allowed us to develop highly exaggerated uh, views of Soviet capabilities. In fact, our first U-2 flight came back with terrible news for Alan Dulles because the first result at the top of the page says that uh, the Soviets cannot possibly have the number of missiles and planes that we've been estimating that they have based on the photos we've just taken. Uh, that didn't change our policy, however. Uh, so. The Dulles brothers set out on a series of operations in which they targeted figures who they believed threatened the United States. Uh, the first two of these, the first two targets, uh, were people against whom they had long-standing grudges. I talked about what the Dulles brothers had done for a living at Sullivan and Cromwell, and, and this had made John Foster Dulles the highest paid lawyer in America. Um, in, 19, in the early 1950s, the Dulles brothers suffered two most unaccustomed defeats and humiliations. Uh, the first came in Iran, when under the leadership of Prime Minister Mossadegh, the Iranian parliament decided to nationalize the Iranian oil industry. The company that owned that industry before it was nationalized had as its bank, its financial agent, a big international bank called the Schroeder Bank. Schroeder Bank was a client of Sullivan and Cromwell. And in fact, Alan Dulles was on the board of Schroeder Bank. So he effectively had to go to his friends and clients and say, we failed you. You hired us to protect your interests in Iran, and he just lost them. This was not something to which they were accustomed or something that they easily forgot. Soon afterward, the same thing happened in Guatemala. Uh, United Fruit Company was one of the major cl uh, clients of uh, Sullivan and Cromwell. Both Dulles brothers worked on the, on the uh, United Fruit account. Both had gone to Guatemala on behalf of United Fruit, um, and both held substantial blocks of United Fruit stock. Uh, 
So not only United Fruit, but the uh, two subsidiary companies through which it ruled Guatemala, the International Railroad of Central America and the electric company that controlled electric generating in Guatemala, uh, were all Sullivan and Cromwell clients. The land reform that was passed by the Guatemalan Congress under the presidency of Jacobo Arbenz affected the interests of United Fruit. It required United Fruit to sell all of its unused land to the Guatemalan government at a price that the Guatemalan government set. And they, they set it in an odd way. They, the, in those days, United Fruit and all landowners in Guatemala paid income tax, but you could value your property yourself. You just wrote in how much your property was worth. And so uh, the court in Guatemala then told United Fruit, well, you've told us how much your land is worth, and we're going to give you every penny. <laughs> they received a complaint note back, not from United Fruit, but from the US State Department, demanding 20 times more. The Guatemalan government did not respond. As private lawyers, there wasn't anything the Dulles brothers could do. Alan Dulles entered the CIA in a secondary position during the Truman administration, and he proposed to Truman and Dean Acheson, first, that we should overthrow the government of Iran, and second, that we should overthrow the government of Guatemala. Both of these plans were summarily rejected by Truman. In fact, uh, Dean Acheson talked about the Guatemala one by saying uh, that there's, there's nothing that could happen in Latin America that would justify an American intervention uh, that would blacken our image there. Because Latin America just wasn't important enough in principle. So just don't even ask me. Don't come to me if the country's in Guatemala, in uh, Latin America. Uh, so the Dulles brothers carried the grudges against Mossadegh and against Arbenz with them into office. They didn't even wait for Eisenhower to be inaugurated before they started meeting with their British counterparts to plot the overthrow of Mossadegh. They achieved that in the summer of 1953. And then, less than a year later, they did the same thing in Guatemala. Now, I've just come back from Guatemala. Uh, this country is hardly beginning to recover from the horrific civil war that took 200,000 lives over 35 years. That was a civil war that broke out after the coup that the Dulles brothers carried out. As for Iran, uh, I don't have to go down the list of the terrible long-term effects. You just have to look at Iran today and what Iran has been for the 60 years since that coup and see what some of those terrible effects were. In the writing business, we have a lot of cliches. And one of them is, every story is either happy or sad, depending on where you end it. So for the Dulles brothers, the outcome of coups like these were very happy because it seemed like the story ended right after the overthrow. So in Iran, for example, we overthrew a guy we didn't like, Mossadegh, and we replaced him with a guy, the Shah, who would do everything we wanted. Seemed like the perfect outcome. Everybody was happy. Well, from today, the perspective looks very different. And if you trace the interventions that the Dulles brothers carried out around the world, you see this pattern over and over again. Let me just mention one more in, in some detail, and that is Vietnam. John Foster Dulles was more responsible than any single individual for beginning the American involvement in Vietnam. He, had, he led the American delegation to the Geneva Conference in 1954, uh, which was to determine the future of Vietnam. He'd only been there a few days when he understood what was happening. The French had just lost their big battle at Dien Bien Phu and were throwing in the towel. They announced that very reluctantly and painfully, they had concluded that Ho Chi Minh was too powerful, he was too popular, and it was just time to give it up and move on to the next battle and realize that Ho Chi Minh had won the right to control a piece of Indochina. Uh, the British agreed with this. And it was clear that the conference was going to come to this conclusion. So Foster Dulles walked out. He left. It's the only time in American history that a Secretary of State has left a major international conference in the middle. Uh, he determined that the United States would fight. Just because the French and the British couldn't do it didn't mean that the Americans couldn't do it. And he set out a plan that Alan Dulles directed to begin American direct involvement in Vietnam. So think of it if that one guy had not made that one decision on that one day as he was flying home from Geneva, we might have avoided the entire US involvement in Vietnam with all of the trauma that that brought to us and to the world. 
Um, later on, the Dulles brothers uh, intervened in a variety of countries. One of the criteria that they used was to attack leaders who embraced an ideology that the Dulles brothers found particularly hateful, in some ways even worse than Bolshevism, and that was neutralism. Uh, Foster Dulles used the word immoral to describe neutralism. Neutralism was the ideology embraced by leaders of new countries that were emerging from colonialism after the Second World War. It meant that we don't want to get involved in the Cold War. We're not part of the Moscow-Washington confrontation. We're going to just concentrate on uh, what we need to do within our country. The Dulles brothers hated this idea. And when they saw these neutralist leaders like Mossadegh and Arbenz, or like Sukarno in Indonesia, or Nehru in India, or Nasser in Egypt, or Lumumba in uh, the Congo, what they saw was a series of patsies for the Kremlin. They saw these people as bridge figures who had been placed in power by communists in countries where it was no, not feasible yet to impose communism, but these people would set up popular fronts and pretend to be neutral, meanwhile doing the Kremlin's work. Uh, so by turning these people into enemies, they turned the United States into enemies of emerging nations uh, who had nothing against the United States. And the reverberations from the rhetoric of those days is still with us. Um, in those days, uh, we didn't use phrases like uh, red line and sanctions and options on the table, but we had similar phrases. And that kind of snarling rhetoric uh, turned many people in the world against the United States. I found a wonderful newspaper uh, from Indonesia during the famous Bandung Conference in 1955, uh, the leaders of many Asian and African countries convened in the city, Bandung in Indonesia. Uh, those leaders represented most the, the majority of the population of Earth. Uh, and it was the first time that leaders of so many countries of this nature had come together. Uh, it was the beginning of what we call the non-aligned movement or the third world. So the, uh, when this conference was announced, one congressman from Harlem, Adam Clayton Powell, went to see Foster Dulles and said to him, this is a great opportunity for us. Let us put together a delegation, not of white Protestant State Department diplomats, but a, a racially, religiously, ethnically mixed delegation, and we're going to send it to Bandung, and we're going to show the face of America as we really are. Foster Dulles completely rejected this idea. He called that conference nothing but a communist roadshow, and he would have nothing to do with it. So this newspaper that I found, there was only one English language newspaper in Indonesia in those days, had two banner headlines, or two big headlines on the two sides of the front page on the opening day of the conference. One said, Soviet Union sends message of greeting for opening of Afro-Asian conference. And the other one said, United States refuses to recognize Afro-Asian conference. There was no reason for us to do that, except the Dulles brothers' belief that neutralism was a big fraud and a big trick. Now, uh, Foster Dulles died uh, in office, or resigned uh, just before dying in the late 50s. Alan Dulles remained in office through the end of the Eisenhower administration. One of the things I find so fascinating about these two brothers is that, although ideologically and politically, they were twins. They saw the world in exactly the same way. Their personalities were polar opposites. John Foster Dulles was a sour, arrogant, self-righteous prude. I read somewhere even his friends didn't like him. <laughs> One of my favorite lines about him, Winston Churchill said that he was, he said, he's the only bull I know who carries his own china shop around with him. <laughs> but I liked Harold Macmillan's uh, comment better. The British are the absolute kings of insults. Uh, he said about Foster Dulles, his speech was slow, but it easily kept pace with his thoughts. <laughs> Alan Dulles was the complete opposite. He was a figure like out of the great Gadsby with beautiful blazers and buckled loafers, endless supply of stories, great connoisseur of wine, an inveterate adulterer who had a hundred mistresses from Claire Booth Luce to the Queen of Greece, uh, a wonderful conversationalist, and I think this was very important because Alan Dulles was not only the head of the invisible government,
he was also the ambassador of the invisible government to the visible government. And he went to so many Georgetown cocktail parties and was so popular and such a wonderful guy that he led the establishment in Washington to conclude, we don't really know what the CIA is and we don't really know what it does, but if it's run by such a wonderful guy, how bad can it be? So Allen's persona played a, a big role in his, in his success. Now, Foster Dulles did not live to see his reputation decline, but uh, fate was not so kind to Alan Dulles. Uh, 36 hours after John F. Kennedy was elected president, he held his first press conference. He wanted to convey this image of vigor and youth. And the first sentence that he spoke in public in his first appearance as president-elect was the announcement that he was keeping Alan Dulles on as head of the CIA. Um, Alan Dulles, by this time, had developed a wonderful plan to overthrow Castro. You remember how we overthrew Castro at the Bay of Pigs? Uh, and he presented this to Kennedy. Kennedy made a series of adjustments in the plan, which everybody involved in the plan understood made it impossible for the plan to succeed. News of the plan then appeared on the front page of the New York Times after the planners had already announced to themselves that secrecy was an absolute condition for its success. They went ahead with the operation anyway, uh, and I think the reason was that Alan Dulles had learned something from Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower had repeatedly told him, I have one quote from Eisenhower in my book where he says, you have to be sure you're going to succeed because once you commit the flag, you commit it to win. When they were overthrowing Arbenz, they had this bogus little air force of about six or eight small planes that they pretended were rebel planes from the Guatemalan Air Force, but were actually CIA planes fl flying in from Florida and Nicaragua. And a number of them suddenly fell out of the sky. One was shot down, one landed in Mexico, a couple had mechanical problems, and they were out of planes. So Alan Dulles found out about this immediately from his men in the field, and he went to Eisenhower, and he said, we need more planes. At the same meeting arrived the legal advisor to the State Department with a bunch of law books explaining why this was illegal. Eisenhower decided, we're going to send the planes. Alan Dulles later said, when I saw my rival coming in with law books, I knew I had won the argument. Uh, but Eisenhower later told Andrew Goodpaster, one of his close associates, uh, once you have committed yourself to violence or the path of violence, it is too late to have second thoughts. You must carry it through. So Alan Dulles heard this and learned this. And I think he probably assumed that Kennedy felt the same way. And there's a climactic moment in my chapter on the Bay of Pigs when they come to Kennedy and say, the thing is falling apart. We need a couple of Air Force planes. And Kennedy effectively says, how many times did I tell you I'm not sending Air Force planes? And they said, yeah, but that was then. And now it's urgent. The whole thing's going to fail. And he said, you didn't hear me. We're not getting involved, not sending Air Force planes. Uh, so that episode ended, of course, as we all know, in a terrible disaster. Um, Kennedy then fired Alan Dulles. And uh, oddly enough, two years later, Alan Dulles turned up on the Warren Commission, which is uh, food for a lot of conspiracy theories. Looking back on the Dulles brothers, uh, we can see that they made some historic, profound misjudgments. And those are misjudgments from which we can learn. The first one was that they refused to pursue peace feelers that started coming out of the Kremlin after the death of Stalin. They'd only been in office a few months when Stalin died in 1953. At the end of 1953, there was a summit in Bermuda of what was then called the Big Three. That was the US, France, and Britain. They had received a message from the new Soviet leader. The interim leader was Malenkov. And Malenkov proposed a meeting of the Big Four. So let's, let me come to your next three. We'll talk about how we can try to manage our conflict. Churchill thought this was a great idea, and uh, so did the French. Foster Dulles was totally opposed. He hated the idea of any negotiation with an enemy. He thought if we sat down with the Soviets, the entire paradigm of conflict on, on which the Cold War was built would dissolve, because it would convey the idea that these were rational people, and they had good ideas, and maybe we could have a conversation, and we'd come up with some agreement like normal people can. And that would destroy the image of the Soviets that the Dulles brothers felt was essential to maintain unity of purpose in the United States. 
Dulles, Foster Dulles actually said several times that Khrushchev was worse than Stalin because he had the same mindset, but he was a nice guy and he was convincing people that he wasn't an evil monster. I mean, we're hearing that now. Watch out for the smiling enemy. Don't negotiate. Just stay firm, don't talk, and ultimately you'll get what you want. So that was their first big misjudgment. They missed possible chances to shorten and uh, calm the Cold War. The second big misjudgment they made was that they completely misjudged the nature of third world nationalism. As I said, they saw it all as a Kremlin plot. Uh, they didn't understand the aspirations of hundreds of millions of people who were emerging from colonialism and looking for their place in a turbulent world. They saw them all as, as potential or real enemy fighters. And they created the United States as a kind of enemy figure to the entire rising third world. This was the biggest force rising in the world in the 1950s, and they completely misunderstood it. The third big misjudgment they made was that they had no concept of what we would now call blowback. It never occurred to them that by overthrowing Mossadegh in Iran, they were setting the stage for 25 years of royal dictatorship and then 30 years of religious rule and brutally, bitterly anti-American hostility from Tehran. They never thought that by intervening in Vietnam, they would start a war in which 2 million people were going to die, including more than 50,000 Americans, or that Guatemala would be plunged into this horror. Take a look at the Congo. Here's a place where we overthrew the first and really only uh, popular elected leader the Congo ever had, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, and with the, uh, with the Belgians, who greatly feared Lumumba, uh, overthrew and, and executed him. Uh, we know what's happened in the Congo over the last quarter century. The number of violent deaths there are said to be in the millions. You, you can't say it all came from the overthrow of Lumumba, but you do have to wonder, had we allowed Congolese democracy to take root and encouraged it instead of crushing it, might we have avoided these situations? This, I think, is a great lesson for today, as are all of the Dulles brothers' misjudgments. Don't talk to your enemies. See neutralists as potential enemies and insist that people either be on your side or you'll be considered hostile. Uh, and never think about the long-term consequences of the interventions that you're carrying out. These are lessons we all need to ponder today, but we're not pondering them because you have to be in the closed conference room opposite baggage claim number three before you can even see an image of one of the Dulles brothers. So as I was concluding my work on this book, um, I developed another interest uh, in a piece of artwork that features the Dulles brothers. I must say that although I deplore the fact that the Dulles brother, the Foster Dulles bust is out of sight, you're only, we miss it only for political reasons. We don't miss it for artistic reasons. It's, it's not a beautiful piece of work. Mrs. Dulles paid for it. I'm not sure she went out and hired the best sculptor available. But there is a work of art featuring the Dulles brothers that I consider one of the masterpieces of political art of the 20th century. Uh, it is a painting by the famous Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. It's 16 feet long on linen. It is a spectacular mural depicting the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala. Uh, so the, story, the back story is this. Uh, as when Arbenz was overthrown in June of 1954, uh, Demonstrations and protests broke out all over Latin America. There wasn't a single embassy, uh, a, a single American embassy uh, in Latin America that did not get either attacked or was the subject of protest marches. Uh, of course, there were protests in Mexico, which borders on Guatemala, and where there was a strong uh, tradition of nationalism and anti-interventionism. Um, during that time, uh, Diego Rivera's wife, Frida Kahlo, was very ill and um, was under doctor's orders not to leave her bed. She was so outraged by the overthrow of Arbenz that she told uh, her husband, uh, I'm getting up and we're going to participate in the protest march together. You can still find a photograph of Diego Rivera pushing Frida Kahlo 
in a wheelchair through the streets at the front of a huge protest rally in Mexico City. Uh, that was the last time Frida Kahlo ever appeared in public. She died 11 days later. And Diego Rivera went on to paint this spectacular mural, Glorious Victory. So uh, I have to tell when I have my students, I have to tell them, don't look it up now. <laughs> but you can find this when you get home on the internet. Uh, so Foster Dulles is right in the middle with a big smirk on his face. And he's shaking hands with his Guatemalan lackey, who he has just placed in as the new dictator. Right behind him is Alan Dulles with a big satchel around his waist from which piles of dollar bills are flowing out onto the ground. Uh, Foster Dulles has his hand on a big bomb, and on the front of the bomb is painted a face of Eisenhower. There are dead children all around him. In the background, Guatemalan laborers are bending under the weight of banana stems, which they're carrying up the gangplank to a freighter with an American flag on it. I studied this painting quite a bit for inspiration while I was writing this book. And as I drew to the end of my project, I decided I'm gonna, I want to go see it. I want to see it in real life. So I called the Diego Rivera Foundation in Mexico and see, to see if I could arrange for a viewing. Or where, where is it? I wanted to find out where, what museum is it in. Well, I got an odd response, quite similar to the response I had gotten at Dulles Airport when I was looking for the bust. They barely knew what I was talking about. And this is the Diego Rivera Foundation. It's a long story, but actually, I had to hire someone in Mexico to go to the various Diego Rivera groups and offices and foundations and figure out what's the story. Well, finally, I got back the note, that painting is not in Mexico. Uh, if you want to find that painting, it's in Moscow. So the story is, as I later discovered it, um, Diego Rivera was a communist. He donated this painting, when he finished it, to the people of the Soviet Union. However, the Soviets didn't like Diego Rivera because although he considered himself a communist, the Soviets did not consider him a good communist. He's one of those Latin American communists who changed his mind and had a lot of ideas that were not exactly what Lenin had written. Besides, Trotsky was his house guest. So the picture disappeared. And literally for 30 years, no one knew where it was. It wasn't until after the end of the Cold War, in the early 1990s, that a handful of Mexican art historians took on the project of trying to find it. And it wasn't easy. It's the picture had once been in Poland. It's a, it's a long story. But anyway, in the end, it turned up. It's in, uh, it's in the Pushkin Museum in, uh, in Moscow. It had been sent abroad once for, to be shown about five years ago in Mexico and in Guatemala. Now I had to consider, is it worth going all the way to Moscow for two hours and stand in front of that picture? Thought about it for a while, and I said, yes, it is. <laughs> so I got in touch with the help of a Russian woman I know with the co correct person at the uh, Pushkin Museum, the uh, deputy director. And I told him, I'm coming to Moscow to see your picture. And I got back a note saying, the picture to which you refer is on a roll rolled up in one of our basement storage rooms. If you come to Moscow, I can take you to that basement and show you the roll. But I cannot unroll it for you because we do not have the space. So this picture, too, maybe it's wrong to say that it's lost because it's not destroyed, but nobody's seeing it. And nobody has a chance to see it. And there's no indication that anyone will ever be able to see it, that it will ever be on display again. So that brings me to my modest proposal. Um, the audience that needs to see that picture is not in Russia. In fact, it isn't even in Guatemala, since the Guatemalans have a good understanding of what happened to them. The audience that needs to see it is us. It's here in the United States. So my idea is that as part of our flowering relationship with President Putin, uh, we should arrange to take that picture out of the basement. Let's bring it to the United States. And I have the exact place to display it. I want it to be the centerpiece at Dulles Airport. <laughs> and we're going to put the bust right in front of it. A little plaques, maybe little excerpts from my book, uh, posing questions that people might think about. This would be a way for us to recover some of our historical memory and uh, recover from the amnesia that allows us to forget episodes that 
we consider unimportant because we don't want to face, but that actually were hugely important, not just in shaping the world, but in shaping the position of the United States in it. It's not right that we've forgotten the Dulles brothers. They are us. We are them. They did not hijack America or force our foreign policy in a direction that no one else wanted to force it in. By understanding them, we understand ourselves better, we confront some of the errors in our past, and maybe we can learn from them lessons that they themselves in life never learned. Thank you. We have about 35 minutes uh, for questions. So do you want to just field the yeah, questions great. and continue? Sir. Well, if you want to add J. Edgar Hoover to the triumvirate, <laughs> it was a very scary time. Uh, but my question would be, in all of your research uh, on the Dulleses, did you happen to come across some things they did right? <laughs> First of all, before I, an be, before I answer that, let me mention, you mentioned J. Edgar Hoover. I'm going to tell you a funny story. Uh, that's a little footnote to the Alan Dulles story. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Alan Dulles hated each other. Uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover wanted to be director of the CIA. Uh, he didn't get the job. And then there were a lot of turf battles over what the FBI should do and what the CIA should do. The FBI, don't forget, had been very active in Latin America for many years. So they wanted to keep Latin America. Alan Dulles didn't want this. So there, were, there was bad blood between them. Flash forward now to the uh, early 1960s, after Alan Dulles has now been thrown out of the CIA and he's in private life. He had two more public appearances. One is he showed up on the Warren Commission. But after that, an, an even stranger thing happened. You'll remember the death of the three civil rights workers in Mississippi. After that happened, Lyndon Johnson called J. Edgar Hoover to his office and essentially told him, I want you to take half the FBI and send them to Mississippi until we get these guys. And uh, Hoover didn't want to do it. Hoover felt like he told Lyndon Johnson, the local police can take care of it. And Johnson effectively said, come on, you know the local police was involved. I want 50 FBI agents. And they, was, they had a big fight. And uh, Hoover kept saying, no, I can't, I can't spare the people. I'm, I'm, fa I'm fighting real crime. So Lyndon Johnson, you know, he, he was really a master maneuverer. How does he like, he wants to light a fire under Hoover. So what does he do? He, he calls Alan Dulles. And he says to Alan Dulles, you're the man I need to go to Mississippi and investigate what happened to those civil rights workers. And Alan Dulles said, I've never been involved in the civil rights movement. I don't know anything about it. And I can't even tell you the name of the governor of Mississippi. And Lyndon Johnson said, oh, that doesn't matter. You gotta be my guy. So Alan Dulles went there. He spent two days. He wrote a little report that was anodyne, didn't say anything, and nobody ever read it. And I don't think even he himself understood what he was doing there, but it worked. Because the minute that Hoover saw that Alan Dulles was in Mississippi, then he really got active. And he started sending FBI agents down there because he didn't want Alan Dulles to take any glory away from him. Um, you ask, what did they do right? Um, I think if the Dulles brothers were here today and, and asked to defend themselves against some of the comments that I've made, for, for example, I think they would say something very similar to what Henry Kissinger says, effectively, when people confront him, what did you do in Timor and Cambodia and Chile? I think his, his real answer is, why are you bothering me about these tiny little details? Those meant nothing. What about what I did with the Soviets, what I did with China? You know, Kissinger famously remarked, uh, I know nothing about, nor am I interested in, the world south of the Pyrenees. And the Dulles brothers are very much the same. They deeply understood Europe because that was their whole training and that was the class they came from. That was their understanding of diplomacy. It was all European, but they had no understanding of the rest of the world. In Europe, however, I think they would argue, and maybe with, with some reason, that they preserved a, a tense peace. They were strong supporters of Adenauer. In fact, Adenauer was essentially the only world leader that ever really liked uh, John Foster Dulles. They were very similar types. Um, so I guess you could say that the, or I think, well, I guess what they would say is, uh, did we have a nuclear war? Did we win, didn't we win the Cold War? Maybe our strategy in the long run worked out. If you are looking at the U.S.-Soviet relationship in Europe, 
You could make that argument. I, I think you could make a counter argument too. But you could at least make that argument. I don't think you could have an argument when it comes to the world south of the Pyrenees. They didn't do anything good there. But you could argue that in their relation with the Soviets and uh, in their management of European affairs, they at least preserved a peace that allowed us all still to be there when the wall fell. Go ahead. I don't know exactly how to ask this because it's not directly about the Dulles Brothers, but does your understanding of the Dulles Brothers and the way that the U.S. was perceived by the Third World and uh, the Soviets were perceived by the Third World of, uh, inform how you view how the U.S. and, say, China are viewed today by the Third World and sort of the dynamic between the U.S. and China in trying to, I don't want to say control, but just gain influence in the Third World. Well, I think one thing the Chinese have learned from us is it's not a good idea to have military forces in other countries. Uh, I give you one example that I see in the world right now, and it's uh, the Persian Gulf. We don't have nearly the same strategic interest in the Persian Gulf now that we had in the Cold War. Uh, you could argue that we had to be friends with Saudi Arabia and all those sheiks in the Cold War, and we needed the oil, but the Cold War's over, and the oil situation is now completely different. Who are the principal consumers of oil from the Gulf and from Saudi Arabia? Number one is China, and number two is India. Those are the main clients for Saudi Arabia. They're not responsible for the security in the Persian Gulf. We're providing the security for China's energy supply, and we're paying for it. And I think the Chinese love this. Why wouldn't they? Well, they're saying they're getting into the trouble. They're attracting the danger. The lightning is coming down on them, and we're getting the benefit. So uh, I guess uh, the Chinese have learned something from being around for 50 centuries, you know, just like the Iranians have learned from being around for 25 centuries, and that is Countries rise and fall. Everything doesn't happen on the schedule that any big country can dictate. Uh, you know, I, I met a woman who was a school teacher in China who came on an exchange trip to the U.S. She was teaching U.S. history uh, in China, so Chinese history in America. And I asked her, so which do you prefer to teach, Chinese history or American history? And she said, well, American history is so much easier because there hardly is any of it. <laughs> and from their perspective, they're right. And I said to the same woman, in my ignorance, oh, China, oh, I can't believe how suffering China's gone through the last 150 years. Opium wars, the country ripped apart, foreign invasions, huge civil war, the cultural revolution, the millions, famine, the deaths. She said, oh, it's nothing. We had a bad century. No problem. <laughs> Maybe we have another bad one. And then there'll be some good ones. Americans don't think like that. And I think uh, that's a reason why China's been around a long time and maybe something we could learn from them. Yes, sir. Uh, why the relationship between the Dulles brothers and, and Eisenhower? Why did Eisenhower keep them around? I mean, you had, as I remember, I think Atchison's father was a minister too, wasn't he? I mean, uh, what, what, uh, well, I, I can tell you this. I've given several dozen speeches on this topic in the last month, and I've never given one in which this question doesn't come up. So what about Eisenhower? I don't even feel the need to bring it up in my speech anymore because I know it's going to come up in the question period. Um, I have a video clip of Alan Dulles during an interview saying, the CIA never does anything without the full knowledge and approval of President Eisenhower. And he was right. Eisenhower was a tough guy behind that smile. He was a firm believer and a fervent supporter uh, of uh, covert action. In fact, when Alan Dulles gave his first pep talk to his men when he first came back from his swearing-in ceremony, he said, this administration has an intense interest in all aspects of covert action. So uh, all of these operations were conducted with the full cooperation and understanding and approval of President Eisenhower. In fact, he went further than the Dulles brothers in some cases. As far as we know, he's the only president that uh, authorized and ordered the assassination of a foreign leader. In fact, he did it twice within the same summer, Castro and uh, Lumumba. Slightly circumlocutious, but everybody got the message. Uh, why did Eisenhower so fervently support covert action? Well, we don't know because he never wrote about it. 
because he never admitted that he did support it, nor that there ever was any covert action. In his memoirs, he lies blatantly about these operations. Uh, like the Guatemala one, he says, I, I received a memo from an American unknown to me, but it sounded more like a dime novel than real facts. This was not true. He had a briefing in his office from the 20 CIA agents who carried out the coup, and the vice president and the attorney general, and everybody was there. And he congratulated them all, shook all their hands. Now, he would say, that wasn't a lie. That was a state secret. And those things you take to your grave. That's why I wrote that in my memoir. In those days, you could still believe that, that nobody would ever know. Uh, but I think we can guess some reasons why Eisenhower was such a great supporter of covert action. One would certainly be that although nobody knew it at the time, we now understand that covert action and secret operations played a large role in winning World War II. We broke the German codes. We had whole armies of uh, planes and tanks that were actually just blow up balloons. Uh, Eisenhower, of course, would have been aware of all these things. So he must have come out of World War II with a great appreciation for what covert action can do. And secondly, I think he would have seen covert action as a peace project. It's an alternative to war. Uh, I think here's a, here's a guy who had to spend, send thousands of people to their deaths. This must have weighed on him. And then people show up and tell him, we overthrew the government of country X and 25 people were killed and none of them were Americans. He must have thought, this is amazing. This is fantastic. It's a lifesaver. Uh, so he also uh, had no concept of blowback. Uh, he, I think we can understand now that uh, he, he also felt that covert action could play a very important, though secret, role in security policy. So Eisenhower's uh, security plan was called the New Look, and it essentially had two pillars. He was a great budget cutter, something we, we've, we don't have those anymore, um, but uh, he always wanted to cut the defense budget. So the new look was, first pillar was cut the size of the army, and the second pillar was nuclear deterrence. But we now understand that the new look actually had three pillars. It was smaller army, nuclear deterrent, and covert action. So that was his security uh, strategy. And talking about blowback, I think we can, in one sense, anticipate it a defense that they would have made, and it's not a bad one if, if they could be accused of this today and, and come back to respond. They might say, we had no idea that covert operations could have huge effects 50 years later, because 50 years before we were in office, there were no covert operations. So we didn't have any evidence about what happened. But we can't use that argument today because we've seen the long-term effects of these interventions. So in that sense, you can excuse them more than you can excuse people who are following those policies today. Yes, sir. So, seems to be American foreign policy tend to look in the 40s and the 50s as the time when great men walked the earth, the wise men, and so on and so forth. True or not, that's kind of the characterization. And, you know, in the early 90s, I listened to a mid level State Department official say, you know, everybody's waiting for Mr. X because it was the post Cold War era. Can you, based on your, your other books and this reading of the Dulles Brothers, Take a measure of the current crop, and I'm not talking about the instantaneous contemporaries, but the current crop of foreign policy establishment leaders, the Holbrooks, the whoever, compared to the people you've been studying so closely. Do you have a sense of how they stack up? Well, giants walking the earth, it's a debatable thought. Yeah, there was George Kennan, but there was also John Foster Dulles. Um, and maybe we're in a somewhat similar situation today, although I haven't noticed the canon out there. Um, I'd say this. Uh, there's one thing that's, that's changed much for the better since the Dulles era and since the 40s and 50s. All during the uh, first half of the 20th century and into the 1950s, the American foreign policy establishment was a very small, homogenous elite they were all white, they were all male, they were all Protestant, they all went to the same colleges, they all went to work for the same investment banks and law firms, uh, 
they vacationed in the same places, they went to the same parties. It was a completely inbred group. That was the Council on Foreign Relations, effectively, which the Dulles brothers helped found in uh, 1921, and Alan Dulles later became president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, it, was, it was a very closed society. For example, William Casey was rejected for membership. Brought, didn't go to good schools, he was Catholic, out of the question. This has changed. Now the foreign policy uh, establishment is much broader. It's much more diverse. I mean, kids grow up today thinking that women make American foreign policy. All there was was Condoleezza Rice, and there was Madeleine Albright, and they're on and on. Uh, so uh, I think in that sense, it's changed for the better. Our foreign policy establishment is much more diverse, and it reflects a, a wider variety of currents. But I still have a, a complaint that I think is a hangover from the 50s, and I think it's a, it's a problem that we had then. We have it interested in a different way now. Every time I go to Washington, which is as rarely as possible, I am struck by the narrowness of the limits within which the foreign policy debate is expected to be conducted. In order to participate in this debate, you have to accept 50 different assumptions. Otherwise, you're considered kind of a wacko, and you're not invited to lunch, and you can't be in the think tank anymore. Just about every big institution in Washington shares in shaping this consensus. And it's very impressive to me how effective that group is in bringing everyone who comes to Washington into that consensus. Uh, there is a certain set of uh, principles that we take as immutable about America. Many of these principles are outmoded, and some of them have been proven wrong. Nonetheless, uh, there's a tremendous pressure to accept uh, that the way the United States has traditionally acted in the world is the right way to act. We change the vocabulary a little. From uh, the interventionist ideology of the George W. Bush administration to the interventionist ideology of the Obama administration, you see a different rhetoric. Uh, it's now called humanitarian intervention. There's different clothing around the same uh, long-term ends. So I think the, the style has adjusted. But I still am uh, frustrated that open debate, questioning the principles by which our foreign policy is shaped, is essentially stigmatized in Washington. And that is a, a real problem for the United States. We have a tremendous inertia in our foreign policy making process. And that's something that institutions like this uh, have a role in trying to challenge. Yes. Being simplistic on my part to suggest that things were simpler than somehow, but now there's such a complex uh, just inter intersection of opinions that it all does get homogenized, but it's just much more complex to run foreign policy. Well, I would say that it, it certainly is more complex today than the Dulles brothers thought it was in the 1950s. But actually, the 1950s much, might have been much more complex than the Dulles brothers truly understood. They saw it as a very simple struggle. But that's not what it was. It, it was multifaceted. Um, you know, I used to know Holbrook. And uh, one of the things he told me once, I, I still remember, he said, uh, Henry, he's talking about Henry Kissinger, he said, Henry likes to say, he, Henry likes to compare diplomacy to chess. He says diplomacy is like chess because you always have to think many moves ahead and what the other guy's going to do. But I don't like that analogy. I have a different one. He said, um, I think of diplomacy as like jazz, endless variations on a theme. Uh, so I think there, was a, there were a lot of variations on the theme out there in the 50s that the Dulles brothers didn't pick up on. All they heard was the central melody. That said, of course, you had essentially two power centers in the world. The third world didn't, was diffuse. It was important, but not a unified power. So in that sense, the world was simpler then. Uh, now, uh, I guess we would look forward uh, with anticipation to a world in which there was just us and one other power to deal with. So there, true, uh, many forces have emerged in the world that uh, make it much more complex today. 
You might argue, however, that some of those forces, particularly some of the most dangerous and destabilizing ones, would not have emerged, at least uh, in their current guise, had it not been for the Dulles brothers. So if the world is much more difficult and complex and dangerous today, maybe they bear some of the blame for it. Is that being simplistic? Yes, go ahead. Um, I wonder if your story has anything to say explicitly about race. I mean, you mentioned that they're all white, and, and the South of the Pyrenees comments suggest that they saw, you know, that that could, have been, that could have been the main criteria by which they thought that the world had to be responded to. Um, and that is the differential between the way they treated the North and the success there, as you might call it, and versus the... Yeah, I think that's true. The rapidness with which they approached the smaller, browner countries. They would think that a, a leader like Sukarno or Lumumba would not be able to master the difficulties of a country. And, and the Americans would have to come in and show them what to do. Whereas in Europe, they had much more confidence in these leaders. And I think there was definitely a racial component to that. Um, they never had any exposure to people of other races. Uh, their social circles were all their own kind of people. Um, <coughs> I think uh, they were, in a way, social Darwinists. You know, they believed that there was a kind of a pyramid of races. They weren't quite as explicit about it as Teddy Roosevelt and Frank Henry Cabot Lodge, but uh, they were heirs to that tradition. I think that's part of what they got from their grandfather. Um, he had come of age in the period of Reconstruction um, and was a, an exemplar of the beliefs that most Americans held during that age. So I, I do think that, uh, that they look down on, on people from south of the Pyrenees. And let me tell you one interesting story that I came up with in my research. You know, historical research is, is endlessly fascinating. And uh, I did a lot of my research in the Dulles Brothers Archive at Princeton. All their files and all their effluvia, just everything, flotsam from the offices, is piled up in boxes there, not just folders of documents, but all kinds of stuff, like the, the menu from the NATO meeting in Denmark in 1954 and all that stuff. So uh, I found, I was going through these boxes, and I found a couple of envelopes. People in this room are old enough to remember what snapshots used to be. They're uh, family snapshots, little black and white pictures in envelopes. And they're tourist pictures. They're just family pictures like any other family. So I'm, I was flipping through them. And uh, I was struck when I suddenly saw a picture of Clover Dulles, that's Alan's wife, standing in front of a Mayan Stella, which I could recognize as a Stella in Guatemala that's right outside Bananera, where the United Fruit Plantation is, was. Uh, so obviously, she and uh, Alan were there a good amount of time. And then in that same envelope, I saw many pictures of Clover Dulles in Guatemala. She's talking with Indian ladies. She's going into marketplaces and small villages. Obviously, she was quite taken with uh, Guatemalan culture, as all of us are who discover Guatemala. Then, in another envelope, I found some pictures of the Dulles, uh, Alan Dulles's weekend house in, on Long Island. On the outside, it looks like every other house on the North Shore of Long Island. But there are also pictures inside. And I, I was shocked when I saw a picture of the living room. Now, other people, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at that photo before. It's just in a box in an envelope. But if it, someone else had, they might not have grasped it. It's a picture of the living room. And I noticed that all the walls in the living room are covered with fabrics from Guatemala. The mantelpiece has Guatemalan artifacts. The rug, it's from Guatemala. I recognize it right away. It means that while Alan Dulles was sitting around on weekends plotting the overthrow of democracy in Guatemala, which would lead to this horror for decades, Guatemala was a huge physical presence all around him. There's something in our nature, maybe, that starts with fascination, then you want to help the people of that culture, then you want to guide them, then you get frustrated with them, and ultimately you end up making them the objects of your coercion. And I think that... Uh, the Dulles brothers felt that they needed coercion because they were not able to see for themselves, partly because they were not as mature as Europeans. Uh, fabulous talk. You've, um, in a sense, brought the Cold War back to life. And one thing I noticed looking around the room is that you've brought the Cold War back to life for people who actually remember the Cold War. <laughs> um, in that regard, I'm struck, maybe alarmed even, at how few brown students are in the audience. What I mean by that is 18 and 22 year olds who actually were born after the Cold War was over. 
So my question to you is, in the larger context here, is, is just a concern over declining interest in history. What your message is to your students here at Brown of how to re-engage and <coughs> get energized by uh, the subject matter, uh, even though they're not here, it's taped. <laughs> Encourage them to tune in. You know, there's a line in that uh, novel by Don DeLillo, uh, Libra. He's, he talks about history, and he says, uh, history is the sum total of everything they don't want you to know. Um, I'll tell you this. I, I think you're right. It is frustrating. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think those of us that are in the history business are partly to blame for this, and it's because um, we've made history inaccessible and, and dry and predictable. Um, in my books, I always like to tell stories. I, I always want people to think, I gotta find, I gotta read the next section so I can find out what happens next. There has to be narrative momentum. I'm not interested simply in uh, reciting facts or, or historical dates. I like to bring up conflicts and uh, personalities, things that engage people. Uh, I like to think in my fantasies that my books would be interesting even to people who weren't particularly interested in the subject because the story is good enough on its own. Uh, but I don't think there's enough of that going on. I can tell you that, um, I'll tell you the comment that I get the most often about my works, and, and this is not just this book, but all my books. And this, is, this probably comprises 50% of all the comments that I get, They're all, is, is the same comment. I get this over and over again, and it is some variation of, how come I never knew any of this? I studied history, or I read a lot of books, why didn't I ever find out about any of these episodes? Uh, so, I tell you, many years ago when I was the age of a Brown student, one of my professors was Howard Zinn. Um, it's been a long time, and of course it was the 60s, so I don't remember too much. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I do remember one thing that I, that I picked up from, that, from Howard Zinn's lectures, and that was that History the way it's written is not necessarily the way it happened. History is just one person's view. And each of you has the opportunity to rewrite history and to rearrange the flower pot, to, to take the footnotes and make them the headlines and <coughs> tell people that the headlines are really not important. Um, to me, this is a very exciting process. And, and I feel that students can be engaged by that. I always tell this to my students. You decide what's important. Don't just take the list of the 10 most important events of the 20th century and think those were the most important 10. That's just one person's list. So just as I, I always try to engage my readers, I never hit them over the head with my point. There's no point in any of my books where I say, did you hear what I just read? Isn't that awful? Let the, let the reader participate. And I like also to let students participate. I'm always trying to get them to express their view about why they think history was written in a, in a wrong way in the past? Or was it written in a right way? Um, what, what do you think were the most important episodes? How would you rank the importance of these different people or individuals? So, uh, and, and maybe one other reason why uh, the Cold War doesn't sound so interesting is that, after all, it was cold. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to point out is that if, you're, if you don't like reading about political conflicts like the Cold War, and you only like learning about real wars, the Cold War really was one. So I'm hoping that uh, in some of these ways, we can try to pull people out of their doubts about history. Go ahead. You almost qualified. <laughs> almost qualified to speak. Um, uh, one point that I was interested in was um, about the collection of the Mayan artifacts. Is that uh, something that I've been interested in writing about for a while? Is um, the Goldwater collection of Hopi Kachina Bells. So I think there's no problem. I think that people with racist beliefs or superiority, <coughs> superior beliefs of their, the inferiority of certain races have no problem collecting the material culture of those, of those people. Indeed. Um, but on the point of, of, the, of narrative and of his, history speaking to um, young people through these big stories of, that are interesting, um, I think what was really fascinating about your talk um, was the fact that in some way, you know, I was a, I studied history at Brown. I'm hearing this discussion of the fact that the personalities and the psychology of these 
particular two people had a had a huge impact on the course of history, um, which you know when we're in history departments at this point now we're supposed to not think in those terms. We're not supposed to necessarily think of like the big personalities of the like people bestriding the world and making these huge changes based on their own sort of psychology. What's interesting to me about what you're talking about is it's sort of like a reversal of the great white men thing, which, whereas yes, great white men had a huge impact on what happened in history, but it was a terrible impact. <laughs> um, so I'm maybe interested in sort of that dynamic. Um, many his history books are drier when they talk about the sort of complicated social and political dynamics that created historical change versus a history book that says these two people did this thing. Um, well, think about the uh, effects that some of the uh, enemies of the Dulles brothers have had in the world. Nobody has forgotten Ho Chi Minh. Patrice Lumumba is probably the most famous African that ever lived. Uh, Fidel Castro has uh, had enormous influence throughout the world. And this all happened as people completely forgot the Dulles brothers. Um, as far as the role of individuals, I think you're right. There, there's a tendency in the academy in some areas to think that uh, everything should be explained by forces and trends and historical theories. Um, maybe I'm influenced by the years that I spent as a newspaper reporter working abroad. I saw so many individuals up close, from Daniel Ortega to Slobodan Milosevic. I watched them. And I came away from that experience unable to believe that individuals do not have a big influence on history. The private psychology of the individual leader is a huge factor. Um, and I think it, leaders also shape the perceptions of their, their, their people, their nations, for good and for bad. I mean, it happened to me. Peter was talking about the Cold War, and I'm, I'm one of those people that's barely old enough to remember it. Uh, so I, I'll, just, I'll just give you one little story to show you about my own involvement. So uh, I learned in uh, Truro Central School in my, like the fifth grade that uh, we had to build a bomb shelter. Every American needed a bomb shelter because the Russians were going to be invading at any moment. So like a responsible youth, I went home to my mother and I told her, we got to build a bomb shelter. My mother said, no, we don't. No reason for that. And I, said, I started repeating all the reasons and so dangerous and where we gonna, how we're going to do it. And she didn't take it seriously. She didn't even want to engage me. I became extremely frustrated. I still remember this moment. I said to her, what are you going to do when the Russians invade? And I still remember her answer. She said, maybe I'll invite them in for tea. <laughs> that was the moment I realized my mother was an idiot. <laughs> and I'll tell you this. If you could go to my house in Truro, which I still live, I still have, and go down into the basement into the crawl space at the back, you'd still find, I'm sure, some rusty old cans of tuna fish and corn and some forks and knives that I put there because my parents were too irresponsible to take care of us and defend our family from the impending invasion. <laughs> Multiply that by 100 million and you get the mentality that was going on in the United States. One of the other cultural factors that I cite in my book as helping to shape this mentality is the paradigm of the Western movie, which was very big in the 50s. These masterpieces like Shane, which is my all-time favorite, or High Noon. Uh, these were all, all these films have the same trope, that there's a, a town or a valley where good people can't live because a bunch of thugs have taken it over. And then one good man with a gun shows up. Nobody has invited him but he knows instinctively what has to be done. The evil here is the responsibility of just a couple of people. And if you just get rid of those couple of people, everything will be happy again. So the stranger takes on the burden of cleansing this town or this valley. He even takes on the moral burden of murder. He kills them. Then sun rises, peace is on the valley, and the hero walks away not wanting anything other than the quiet gratitude of the people that he's rescued. It's not an accident that when Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States, only after Foster Dulles had died, because that would have killed him, I can tell you. Uh, and when he came to Camp David, Eisenhower showed him that movie, Shane. It was during the Berlin crisis, and, and uh, there's a line in that movie that says, this is our valley and we ain't gonna move. <laughs> 
this also, I think, greatly influenced Americans with this, it created this self-image of ourselves as the lone saviors who go in to places that are deeply troubled and we realize that all trouble is only caused by a few evildoers. We'll just get rid of those and everything will be fine. So this oversimplifying of a complex world undergirded the entire 1950s. We're out of time, but there's wine and books in the front. Wine and books! Thank you so much. Thank you.